Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me for this talk entitled Is Translation Worth Studying? My name is Maciej Ditvin. I work at the Department of Translation at University of Wrocław. Well, it's my pleasure to host you now, and I hope that if you decide to stay with me for the time of this presentation, um, you will have reflected a little bit on the reasons why as a young person, or maybe as an active professional, you might want to be interested in learning more about translation and interpretation. The title of this presentation, um, it's straightforward and simple, but it does sound a little bit like the kind of question that an academic would put and to the general public in order to explain why they think that their work is important, or why they think that the discipline that they have chosen is important among other disciplines. I do believe that translation, translation studies as an interdiscipline, that it is really a very important phenomenon in the academia. Uh, it has been booming in the last 30 to 40 years, and I think it is meaningful. But my business here is not to talk about translation in purely academic terms or about translation as a discipline or an interdiscipline. I will not discuss translation in linguistic terms only or in terms of the hermeneutic tradition or trying to combine the two, showing uh, the interesting discussions that are taking place. There are people who have dealt with these discussion with these issues of translation studies of the phenomenon they have dealt with that much better than I could possibly do it now so if you're interested in translation studies itself as a discipline interdiscipline there are fantastic books out there on the market that you can follow however if you are now a young person who has chosen to study a foreign language like English or you're thinking about it and you're asking yourself, well, what future, what kind of future does lie ahead if I pursue this? And perhaps what would happen if I choose, if I pick translation as my specialization track somewhere down the road as a student of English, for instance, at a Polish higher education institution? If you in that group, if these are your questions, I think I have something for you here. If you're simply a person who has practiced translation, is interested in English or Polish, works in these two languages, it could be English and any other language for that matter, and you haven't really been into formal training in translation, I also think that I may have some interesting thoughts to share with you. Anyway, our outlook is pragmatic. My assumption is that you do not have to, you do not necessarily have to study translation in order to be a good translator. But let's go step by step. Let's start with uh, an important perception that has gained currency in the last century for good reasons. But as a perception, it has, well, it has its specificity. It shows us something while concealing something else. Let us start with a very simple question. And the question is this. Why do young people choose to study languages today? Well, the way I see it, and that's based on conversations I have had with students at, uh, well, one, higher education institution in Poland, at least one, which is my home university. I think there are at least three, maybe four groups. Uh, there's a number of students who have decided to study English because they like the language. <laughs> That's a very important motivation. We should never downplay it, really. Genuine interest in, in English history, culture, literature, in the phenomenon of global English, and the phenomenon of British American English. Students like English and therefore they choose to study the language. 
There are other students who say that uh, they have selected English because they like the language and they like to teach other people the language. So they would like to work as teachers. We need good teachers. Good teachers are priceless. So these students are already thinking about some more pragmatic steps to take in the future, how they would use the skills that they would have as multilingual communicators. And now I say multilingual because I'm thinking about English as a foreign language principally. If you want to teach the language, uh, you have to assume that there are people who don't speak it. So already your imagination is shaped by this awareness that English is a language that comes in contact with other languages. There's another group of students who want to use English for business and business used in a very, very broad uh, way, broad sense. It could be business as profit making, but it could be business as some kind of social work. It could be business as some kind of international engagement, engagement in multilingual institutions. And we know that there are some institutions that use English as, as a working language, even though they're not based in England or in America or any other English speaking country for that matter. It's multinational, international organizations. And finally, we have students who will say that, well, I am studying this foreign language. Well, we assume it's English, but it could be any other because I want to become a, a translator. I want to become an interpreter. That's important for us because translation and interpretation, if it appears in student conversations, it generally appears in the context of becoming a professional in the field. The perception is that translators, interpreters are useful mediators, people who um, have expert knowledge in some field and they know at least two languages very well. These fields Prototypically, that would be law, finance, technology, medicine. And translation training would be perceived as helpful if you desire to enter the translation profession. Well, that is based, based on an important assumption. The translation profession is important today because it makes globalization work. Well, these are the perceptions, the ideas and circulations that we begin with. Now, if you assume that translation today is important because of globalization, uh, you quite right, it is important for these reasons. There has been a massive increase in the volume of international business over the last few decades. But there's also been what we call the digital revolution. Digital processing methods facilitate international communication. 30, 40 years ago, even 20 years ago, you would have needed some basic understanding of the language spoken in a country if you wanted to work there. Now with your smartphones, with your fantastic applications, translators, digital uh, translators, well, you can actually make do in a completely foreign environment. So globalization, it is true, it needs translation. But globalization is be possible because of the digital revolution and the digital revolution has changed the situation of translation and translators significantly. Some people would even ask whether or not we would need translators in the future. Machine translation has been extremely successful. Well, of course, there are these jokes about uh, the kind of mistakes that a machine can make if you ask, if you type something, enter something and you ask for a translation. Well, that's true, obviously. Uh, the specialists in the field haven't managed to eliminate the need to have a human being simply check the quality of translation. And I don't think personally that that would ever be possible for reasons that we don't have the time to discuss now. But the point is that just as 20 years ago, we would laugh at the results of translators, digital translation. We're not laughing now, definitely not. There's been fantastic progress in the field. 
Now, all of that is important if you just think about translation as a profession. A profession, well, you, you enter a profession to do something worthwhile, but you need to earn money. And I think that the role of machine translation, digital methods, all of that is extremely important for people who want to enter the profession now and in the future. But what's important for us now is that this view of translation as something that you do to earn a living is a recent view. For countless generations before us, when I say us, I mean people living now or people who uh, who were active professionally in the second half of the 20th century. For countless generations before this, let's say, group, translation was something that each educated person would do for other reasons. How come? <laughs> well, we have to go back in time. I promised you this would be a, a practical talk. So when I say that, well, we now need to go back in time to ancient Rome, it's a bit like going back on my word. But bear with me for a moment. I do think you'll find it interesting. Translation was used in ancient Rome and in the classical tradition. And when we say the classical tradition, we mean countless schools in Europe, in the Western world and elsewhere who followed the method of education developed and formulated really in ancient Roman and Greece. Translation in that context was not used to um, transmit or to convey information. It was used in order to practice your language skills in your mother tongue. Think about that. You have a noble family in Rome, say senator family, they do have a native speaker, a Greek person at their household. So the children are exposed to the Greek language as spoken by the Greek people from relatively early age. So they're very often really fluent. They know Greek. They don't have to read in Latin in order to understand philosophers such as Aristotle. But still, they are trained to translate and they are trained in translating in order to develop the language skills in Latin. If you want to be a great orator, the story goes, you have to practice public speaking. And there's no better way of practicing other than looking up close at the great speeches delivered by the classic orators in Greek and translating them. If you do that, you are creating workspace in which to explore grammatical, stylistic nuance, semantic nuance, the kind of stuff that you normally pass over if you simply read. So, translating to become good orators, translating to master grammar, and hence the two ways of translating, that the Romans identified. You would translate differently if you simply practice public speaking. You would translate in a slightly different manner if that was done in the scope of this basic curriculum that they called grammar. Now that's interesting for us. Because our assumption is, well, translation makes globalization work. Globalization is about commerce, largely, and exchange of ideas. So it's all about conveying information which is otherwise inaccessible. Romans and the classical tradition in general teaches us that you may translate even if the kind of information that you are processing is accessible after all. You may do that in order to understand better the process of communication. Well, it sounds like a bit of a stretch, doesn't it? So let's look at one testimony. This is a fragment from a book by Norman Davis, the British historian. And the fragment is about an eminent uh, writer and historian, um, uh, Edward Gibbon. 
Uh, he lived in the 18th century, and this uh, this fragment is comes from Gibbon's memoirs. You can have a look at at the paragraph that starts with the words "at the age of 16." It's it's right here. So let's read it. At the age of 16, Gibbon already possessed mastery of Latin and a confident command of ancient Greek. He now launched into a systematic reading schedule, which would take him author by author through every single major work of the classical repertoire. After an extensive examination of Cicero, he started on the historians before working his way methodically through all the poets, all the orators and all the philosophers. What is more, he supplemented his basic reading by studying all the leading commentaries on each major author, by writing up abstracts in French of every book he read, and in due course, by corresponding in Latin about his studies with senior scholars in France, Switzerland and Germany. This was the self-imposed schedule of a teenager who had no Nintendo games, no computer games, no CD-ROM. That's interesting, don't you think? <laughs> it is interesting because Gibbon, until today, as the author of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, counts as one of the greatest writers in English. So, if you look at biographies of major writers, philosophers and scholars, you will find that they often translated something else. These are just quick examples. If you look into biography of Mickiewicz, you will find that he did translate. The same goes for Mochnatsky, the famous essayist, and the same goes for Tuvi Miłosz Szymborska. I think that these names are familiar if you have ever been uh, at a Polish school. There are other names, not so popular, but they would have been known to people who lived uh, and, and worked as scholars 50 uh, who, who lived as, uh, in Europe and who worked as scholars a few centuries uh, before us. Boethius, great medieval philosopher and translator. Orem, uh, a person to have laid the foundations of um, geometrical representation of uh, uh, mathematics in, in the 14th century. And finally, Copernicus, it's, it's a, not a very well-known fact that before he even went public with his astronomical theories. He did translate a Greek work into Latin. And as far as I know, this was the first translation um, from uh, Greek into Latin done by a Polish writer that we know of uh, in the early 16th century. The point is, active intellectuals, people of science, scholars, philosophers, poets, public speakers, they are very often beneficiaries. They are very often users of translation for reasons that are other than simply conveying information. Conveying information obviously would have been important, at least in the transmission of knowledge, but it was not the only reason that people knew of. Of course, you will say that today education is no longer elitist, and you're right. You will say that we have unprecedented access to hands-on learning materials. Again, the internet comes up, and you're right. It would seem that the old reasons for incorporating translations, translation, interpreting into general education, all of that, that is out of date. Well, I beg to differ. I want you to join me in an experiment. Now on the screen, you can see um, a web link. This should refer you to an article written in a British newspaper. This article comes from the spring of 2018. It was already published. It's still accessible. I hope you're able to access it now as you're watching this presentation. This article is about uh, an event that is already accomplished. 
in 2018, the city of Oxford approached the city of Wrocław in, in order to discuss a partnership agreement. The news uh, appeared in, in early, well, it was, I think it was mid April 2018. The agreement was signed in October 2018. Now, please join me in the following scenario. You are asked to, well, come up with a translation of this article into Polish. Imagine that you are translating on the day of publication. So you can look at the date. It's next to the author and you can simply um, you can simply translate, assuming that you are working on the day. It would be, I think, if I remember well, 17th of April 2018. Now, in this scenario, assume as well that you are working for the city of Wrocław. You are based in Wrocław, you're based in Poland, and you are a public um, employee. You work for a local government institution. So this local government will be obviously interested in the development in the interests of Oxford, and it will be interested in um, uh, actually signing the agreement with Oxford. That's, I think, common perception. Um, and obviously that perception is based on the assumption that such a kind of an agreement with a, with a city that is known across the globe is a meaningful and a desirable development in local politics. So go ahead now with this translation. And if, when you're done, you can move to another slide. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I assume that you have tried to translate this text. Uh, some of you probably uh, did the whole thing, others just had a look at it and tried some sentences, but all of you probably have a general idea what this text is about, and you also have some questions and some perceptions about how problematic the translation itself would have been. I have selected three sentences. These are the sentences that the students that I worked with um, usually pointed to when I asked them to translate this text. Um, some of them started with uh, the middle sentence, Mr. Tanner paid for his travel to and from Wrocław and is also secretary of the Oxford European Association. We'll go back to it. Um, some actually said that already from the start that there were some elements that they weren't sure how to approach. And there was one more sentence that the third one on the screen, um, a few students would, would actually say that uh, they were not sure about one detail of that, but the third sentence was usually the one that I asked them about. Again, for the reasons that will be clearer in a moment. Now, we have this sentence. Oxford will soon have a new twin city of Rotterdam in Western Europe. Now, the, the problem with this sentence is my um, my as the students that I've that I've worked with have you usually mentioned is this. We all know where Wrocław is. And adding that it is a city in Western Poland in a text which is ultimately to be used for publicity in Wrocław, but adding that bit is counterproductive. It is counterproductive for a very simple reason. If you want to boast that Oxford has recognized Wrocław as an important partner and it wants to sign an agreement with you, well, then if you then start adding that they don't know where it is and they need a clarification, well, you are in a way acting um, against the very purpose why you set out publishing or talking about the article in the first place. The point is that most British people would know where Warsaw is, most British people would know where Krakow is, and clearly, at least according to the author of this article, they wouldn't know where Wrocław is. And that's a snag. It's not a snag in itself, 
but it is a snag if you consider the reasons why we are interested in this article in our scenario. So let's move on. These are the solutions that some of the students in class came up with. You have the sentence again, and you have four solutions, four excerpts from four students. Please have a look at those. Now, if you have read these, you probably noted that there's so much going on when the students are translating it, actually. Look at all the transformations, all the changes that have taken place. Nowe siostrzane miasto Oksfordu ogłoszone w Polsce, ogłoszono nowe miasto, polskie miasto partnerskie Oksfordu, ogłoszono, które polskie miasto zostanie kolejnym miastem partnerskim Oksfordu, Wrocław partnerem Oksfordu, Wrocław będzie miał wkrótce nowe miasto partnerskie Oxford. Now the interesting bit is that it sounds from this that Oxford was really adding one more Polish city to the list of its partners. That's what might appear um, to the readers if they read sentence number two. Sentence number three goes to some extent to clarify this, we, that, that there would have been some Polish cities and not Wrocław was selected. Um, and then in number, sentence number four, we have an interesting transformation um, Wrocław partnerem Oxfordu. Wrocław będzie miał wkrótce nowe miasto partnerskie Oxford. Um, Oxford will soon have a new twin city. Wrocław is not exactly the same thing as Wrocław will have soon a new twin city. As you can see the perspective, the point of view from which the story is being told to the public, that perspective has changed. We have in a way shifted from an Oxford based text to a Wrocław based text. There's a fancy name for this transformation in cognitive linguistics. We don't need to go in, into details and use the jargon, but just think about it as a planetary system. It does matter. It does matter. It does really change a lot if the Earth is stationary and the Sun is moving around it, or the Sun is stationary and the Earth is moving around it. If Oxford is really aspiring to join Wrocław, that's a strong message. If Wrocław is aspiring to join Oxford, that's slightly a different story. I, I think you will agree with me on this one. So even that, the very simple thing, the first sentence, does come with intriguing questions, and these questions have a common denominator. If we want to publish this text in Wrocław, such dangling bits as, you know, adding, clarifying where the city is, they may be actually offending, they may be counterproductive, and you might feel compelled to get rid of it. And the moment you feel compelled to get rid of it, you're faced with the question, do I have the authority to get rid of it? Now the middle. The middle question, the middle sentence, Mr. Tanner paid for his travels to and from Wrocław and he's also a secretary of the Oxford European Association. This is mystifying. And students are generally puzzled when they see this sentence for good reasons. Some students, however, took the time to scroll down the page and look at the comment section. And what they discovered was that apparently at the date of publication, there was a lot of political tension in Oxford about the expenses of public officials. Now, Oxford as a city um, uses the same name as the university, but the city of Oxford and Oxford University are two different entities. One is local government, the other one is a global education and research institution. Now we tend to forget about that, so we imagine Oxford would be a very rich city. The fact is that, well, there are very many rich people living in Oxford, but the city itself struggles with many public services, at least according to politicians from Oxford. So the idea to travel abroad and fund that from the public purse would be controversial. 
here we have the bid which clarifies that Mr. Tanner paid for his travel. And now this other element, he is also secretary of the Oxford European Association, doesn't seem to be connected with the previous one. If you delivered an essay, a student essay that has something like that, well, I think you would find an, uh, a comment in red ink, simply. So how come we have this sentence? That's another secret of this article. The first one was that it is Oxford centered and we want this information to be brought of centered if we're publishing it here. Another secret is that this is an article that was written in a hurry and it was written specifically to be published on the web. That's the kind of article that you read within 15 seconds. I don't, I don't think you would need more. Please note how many paragraphs there are. And please note how many sentence, sentences there are per paragraph. That's the kind of text that is simply read at great speed. The kind of news that you digest, or you don't really digest them, that the kind of news that you read in large quantities every day. And that kind of uh, strange way of joining ideas and associating them is possible if um, information is processed at such a speed. And that means both the author probably didn't take much time to deliver that, and by the people who read that, who would, if you have that kind of strange solution, who would infer, who would guess from the context the precise reasons why you um, want to have a sentence that is constructed in, in this way. Let's move on. Here's the third sentence. Councillor John Tanner travelled to Wrocław to agree an outline for a formal partnership with the chairman of Wrocław City Council. That, that there seems to be nothing offending in this sentence. Uh, it's, it's a straightforward one. But when you look at the actual choices that some of the students came up with, in fact, you will see another problem about this article. We've discovered that it was probably written in a hurry. If you look at the article, you also um, discover that it was written based on only one source. Only Mr. Tanner is cited. No one from the city of Wrocław is cited. You know, the old journalist rule, you need two sources in order to accept that something is true, two independent sources. Theoretically, it is possible that someone made this up. So, you know, normally you would perhaps write a message and ask for a comment and they would give you a comment in that sense also um, verifying or um, attesting that it's really happening, that this partnership is being discussed and maybe giving you a perspective. It would be a positive perspective, obviously. But that's interesting for us because we see that the journalist didn't really invest a lot in uh, writing this article. Now, the point is that if you translate this sentence for the Polish public and you translate that for people who have some basic understanding of politics in large cities in Poland and specifically in Wrocław, you will discover that for many people this bit of information would be quite surprising. The point is that Mr. Osowski, the councillor, um, and here it's he's called the chairman of the council. I think the speaker would really be a better term here. Mr. Osowski would not be normally the, the person to consult in order to work out a, a political agreement for a, and a form of partnership. Here's a trick. Under the British system, if you are a councillor, you obviously have some legislative function to carry out. 
you know, passing bylaws, the local acts of law. But you can also be engaged in executive functions, actually managing the, the city affairs, actually carrying out the policies that were agreed upon in, in, in votes that were passed. Under the Polish system, that's not the case. Under the Polish system, the executive branch of the local government is the mayor and the legislative branch, the legislature, that's the city council. If you are a city council, you do not represent the mayor, you represent the voters. So you cannot work for the mayor and at the same time be a city council. You cannot be employed at the city hall and be a councillor. Politically, you may collaborate, and that's the case here as well. But the point is that a formal partnership would be worked out by the mayor's staff, and the mayor would meet, the city council would vote to approve the political direction in general. They would say, yes, we want this agreement, but this agreement would not be um, worked out, the details would not be drawn up by the city council itself under the normal process. So imagine that you simply open up a newspaper or you open up an article and you learn that uh, there is a meeting and for many people, for many readers, the reaction would be, goodness me, why was the mayor sidestep? Why did they go around him? Do you want that as a translator? Isn't it counterproductive if you simply wanted to cheer up everyone with the news that Rostov would have a city um, that is worth partnering with. Well, the reason, and I can tell you for a fact, is that the mayor did ask the, the speaker of the council to meet with Mr. Tanner because he was absent from Rostov on the day. And the two gentlemen collaborate Close, did collaborate closely and, and, and obviously that was a part of the plan. But the point is, if you and your translation suggest using specific Polish wording that the kind of talks that were taking place were definitive, you are misinforming the audience. You would really have to be very careful about how you phrase it. And again, that's something that many students that I've worked with, not so much struggle with, but spent some time reflecting on. Have a look at that. This simple translation experience shows you that it's so much more than just words. Extra linguistic concerns in these three examples are at the center of our attention. And we cannot possibly solve the puzzle, unless we know why we translate. I told you in the beginning, in, in this scenario, you assume you work for the city, this is for publicity reasons, but you need more details. Would that be published on the web page, integrally, the whole article? Do you just want citation from the article? Or maybe you want to translate the article, cite it, put quotation marks and paste it into your Twitter feed, perhaps, and publish that on Facebook, you know, to show, to share the good news with the, with the people here. The reasons why we translate this and how the translation is to be used are central to determining how to solve the specific dilemmas that we're confronted with. And finally, we have discovered here, I hope you'll agree with me, that the features of this text, which is a web text, such as compression, simplification, and that even to the point of loss, they also have to be somehow interpreted. And you have to take a stance relative to these solutions, sometimes boldly separating one sentence into two sentences. And I say boldly, because if you can put a full stop where you want, well, someone may go and ask, who gave you the authority to do that? Why are you rewriting the article rather than simply translating it? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think that what we find based on this example, and again, this is not revolutionary, this is not new, it's just simply true and maybe new for some of us. 
translating is always deeply contextualized. It was for, for the Romans and it is for us. The skills we develop when we practice translation, when we discuss this practice are useful, very much beyond the translation profession. In a way, just as people needed translating to improve their public communication skills, we need translating to understand the communication ecosystem that we live in. And much like centuries ago, translating today does offer a unique way of deep analysis. What has changed is the context of this analysis. And studying translation today is like just like in the past, studying close up the reality that we live in. There are two languages obviously involved. So you study up close linguistic structures of at least two languages and they're used. So you may want to study translation in English in order to speak Polish better. That will be very helpful. Many students of English do have problems with their Polish skills, really. In, uh, if, they, if, if you work with them in, in these bilingual programs, Polish English. So linguistic structures and their use, obviously, but also cultural differences. A lot of encyclopedic knowledge about the world. Then you study up close multimodal communication. You study up close digital information ecosystems, such as, you know, these press releases that we've just looked at. You study digital media economy, the length of sentences that sit neatly on the smartphone screen. And you study human machine interaction because more and more the necessity is that you rely somehow on digital processing methods. If not in order to produce texts, then perhaps to correct them for your peers if you work in a group. All of that, all these things are the things that you would study if you study translation today. Because translating is always deeply contextualized, ladies and gentlemen, studying translation will help you understand the world around you. Now, what this might mean for you, you would have to decide for yourself. But if our task, if our ambition here was to consider simply whether translation is worth studying today, I would conclude that I think it is, and not exactly for the reasons that most people, most undergraduate students would readily assume. Obviously, translation training program is most useful if you're thinking about entering the profession. But there are very many reasons why you would choose to spend some time studying translation other than entering that translation profession or the interpreting profession. OK. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope you found it uh, interesting. One way or another, thank you very much for sharing this time with me and thank you for joining me to reflect on these questions. So that's it for me. I'm much needed. Thank you very much.